This is the plenary two. Anyway, uh, challenges and opportunities for progressive public education. And my name is Lita Sizer. I'm a, a, a professor here at Sarah Lawrence, to my great delight. Um, I am also, yes, related. Um, uh, Theodore and Nancy Sizer were, are my parents, for which I have always been delighted as well. Um, it's my job as moderator to somehow to pull together uh, the work of the scholars who are going to speak um, in some kind of meaningful way as a as a springboard to to their work. And I decided in the in my father's tradition that the best way to do that is to tell a story about a student. And I will I will tell you that. Uh, I just got off the phone with him because I called him to make sure it was okay. And I have his number on my phone, which will give you a sense of how important he is to me. Um, and he answered, so I guess I'm important too. <clears throat> so let me tell you the story, and it is a story about challenges and opportunities. Um, uh, a week and a half ago, I got a phone call from a good friend um, who uh, told me um, that this young man, Baba, I'm not gonna use his last name even though he gave me a leave, um, had just gotten accepted, um, I'm gonna give you the good news first, had just gotten accepted to an MFA program at Columbia in poetry. Now, this was a uh, incredible moment for me because it, uh, it, it uh, represented um, everything that he had wanted and that we had wanted for him but we had thought w might be tilting at the moon. Baba immigrated to this country um, at 11 years old. Um, he was a political refugee from Senegal. Uh, he went first, um, after considerable violence to his family, he went first to France, and he lived for a while in a refugee camp before uh, the French kicked him out. He had to go back to Senegal, which was very dangerous, and then, uh, and with a stroke of luck, uh, got a visa to the US. Um, he was then living with his father, who he barely knew, um, uh, and because his mother had died when he, he was six. Uh, and so he then went to live with his father. The two had, had not been married. So he comes to this country at 11 with a stepmother who's quite resentful of him, a father he doesn't know very well, and speaking lots of beautiful languages, none of which was English. Uh, it was uh, very difficult. Um, this is the challenges part. He, uh, he was in the Bronx, um, in the part of the South Bronx, where the schooling was really not very good, although he found some wonderful teachers there. Um, he uh, you know, was not able to speak English, and he was regularly laughed at for it when he would go up to the board to do uh, math problems, even though he typically often got the right answer. Uh, what happened was really, I think, a kind of miraculous and to some degree really centered around Baba's emotional generosity because Baba was very open to being helped. He not only had people who wanted to help him, but he, he, um, he reached out to people. So he's, it started with teachers in, um, in high school who saw his interest and pushed him and gave him extra books and met him out of school in the library to have what we call at Sarah Lawrence conferences over at the extra books that they'd given him. Now this was complicated by the fact that he was a very, very good soccer player and so was playing a lot of soccer and he also, after the age of 13, um, was uh, uh, expected by his family to provide an, um, uh, an income for the family. So after 13, under the table, he started to work. Um, now, this uh, then brings in uh, another um, a school with which I am associated very happily, again, delighted. Um, three of my four children go to the Fieldston Ethical Culture School in the Bronx. Um, and that year, by happenstance, uh, one of the ethics teacher was on sabbatical and she um, saw not only Baba but another one of his classmates. Um, she met a lot of students, but she saw the, the kind of fierceness of their desire uh, to get somewhere other than where they were um, intellectually. Uh, and so she, um, I'm sure there was a lot of help along the way. I don't know all the people who helped, um, but she 
um, made some phone calls and some Fieldston parents put up some money and uh, she, uh, Baba and, and his um, classmate uh, got a full paid um, year um, post, -grad, uh, post uh, um, what do they call it, an, an additional year at high school um, at Fieldston. And uh, as part of this, uh, he moved into um, the extra bedroom of um, the friend who had been calling me uh, because they thought that he wouldn't be able to do uh, remunerative work and childcare and, 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 tr and, and try to start um, overcoming some of the obstacles that his schooling had, had, had made you know, more difficult. Now, this, here's where I come in. Um, th that friend, um, her husband was uh, 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 this wonderful Brett uh, uh, coach and I'd been coaching with him for many, many years. I coached um, a team called the Riverdale Ruffians. Um, uh, I was the assistant coach, and we coached together for 12 years, and it was uh, a, a fabulous experience. Um, an incredibly diverse, um, largely immigrant um, uh, group of really wonderful young men. Um, and uh, my son was one of them, and, and Ian's son was one of them. And Ian and his wife adopted, essentially adopted Baba in, in many, many ways. He's still in connection with his father, but there's some conflict there. Um, uh, and uh, Baba started playing on our team. We, we only got him for a year because he aged out, which was really devastating, but okay. That's another story. Um, he kept helping out after. He realized that I had, for many years, uh, done pro bono volunteer work um, working with um, any of my soccer players who wanted uh, to work on their writing. Um, uh, so, and I've, I had an, I've had, an, had a number of students um, that way who came through the soccer team um, at, and w essentially kind of gave them conferences in creative nonfiction to help them apply to college. So he knew this about me and he asked me if I would do it for him. And, uh, and I did. I did for starting the summer before his year at Fieldston throughout that year and then for the two following summers because not because I have so much extra time Jerry Dodds here will tell you that I don't however <laughs> Baba was incredibly persistent he really really wanted to learn how to write better and he and think better which writing is a representation of and so we wrote uh, he wrote I read um, uh, his memoir uh, and it, 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 it there was never an end point to it. Um, he would write a piece and then we would talk about what he'd written, how he'd written it, and what part of it he'd left out. And then he would write that part. And then we'd talk about that and he'd write another part. So it's all very scattered. Um, but it's really a representation of his will and his desire. And he, and he was very good, he still is very good at drawing people toward him to help him grow. Um, as a result of that year at Filston, he was accepted to Worcester College, which, as you, you probably know, is a very, a very good liberal arts college. Um, and I did work with him over the summers um, uh, while he was there. It was, he just told me on the phone, his first semester there was very, very difficult, which I think is a real kind of, is, is kind of useful to hear um, uh, at the college level that we reach out and we give uh, you know, extra scaffolding to people coming from very different ec uh, educational and cultural backgrounds um, so that they can make that transition. Um, his, his story is a, I mean, his story is a story of profound success. I'll tell you that reading that um, memoir, I would never have thought that he would be able to get to where he got because even though it's, it was haunting and still pieces of it haunt me now, it was written in quite broken English very often it felt like he had translated it from French. Um, and I didn't see where he, how he was gonna get to his dream of being a poet and a, and a college professor. And, and he did it. Now, this is a story of both challenges. His were very grave and opportunities. And to a great extent, it was a communal effort. It was an effort where people respected um, his background. Um, and respected where he was coming from and helped him make sense of it. Um, and, and it was a, a question of community because I was only one of very many people who um, 
were more than willing to help this young man um, find a way uh, from no way. He's like um, a modern Josie. Um, I love that, uh, that story from W.E. Du Bois. I, I very often teach the souls of black folk. And I was so um, moved when Jay pulled that story out because it's always been the one that leaps out at me. Well, Baba is like Josie. Um, and hopefully now we can talk a little bit about how to make room for more Babas, uh, for more Josies, um, uh, not only in our, in our high schools and in our communities and in our colleges. Let me introduce the people who are gonna talk, speak to this more specifically. Okay, Ann Cook is a Sarah Lawrence alum, which means she's very creative and she does excellent research. <laughs> Just saying, putting that out there. She's the ex executive director of the New York Performance Standards Consortium, uh, a coalition of 28 New York State public high schools that have developed and implemented a performance-based system of, assess of assessment in lieu of high-stakes testing. She's also co-founder of Urban Academy Laboratory High School, located in the Julia Richmond Education Complex in New York City. She has taught at Sarah Lawrence, Brooklyn, and Queens Colleges, and has written numerous articles on educational reform, schools, and teaching. She has authored several children's books, including Meet Monster, which has a fabulous title, and is the parent of three children who graduated from New York City Public Schools. Cecilia Espinosa, who will go second, was born in Ecuador, uh, South America. She worked in Phoenix, Arizona as a bilingual multi-age teacher and a, um, a Title VII director at a progressive school the W.T. Mackin School, am I pronouncing that right? She's a graduated, uh, graduate from Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. She is now an associate professor in the Early Childhood, Childhood Department at the School of Education at Lehman College, CUNY. Her areas of concentration are bilingualism, literacy, biliteracy, English as a second language, teacher research. It was at the W.T. Mackin School that Cecilia first encountered the profound value of descriptive processes developed by Patricia Carini and her colleagues from Vermont. She has continued to deepen her understanding of these processes over the last several years. Cecilia is a member of the Descriptive Inquiry Study Group, which meets in New York City once a month. Deborah Meyer, of course, needs no introduction, but I'm going to anyway. She's a senior scholar at um, new, uh, NYU's Steinhardt School and a board member of the Coalition of Essential Schools, Fair Test, SOS, and Dissent, and the Nation ma magazines. She spent 45 years working in K-12 grade public schools in New York City and East Harlem, and also in Boston, the Roxbury um, part of Boston, including leadership of several, several highly successful, small, democratically run urban schools the Central Park East Schools, and Mission Hill. Her books include The Power of Their Ideas and In Schools We Trust, among others. In 1987, she was the first educator to receive a MacArthur Genius Award, and she currently blogs for Ed Week with Pedro Noguera. Hi. I'm, I'm very glad to be here at Sarah Lawrence. Um, it was an important institution in shaping my early thoughts on education. And most, pro most importantly, providing me with the perfect venue for social activism, in which my classmates, three of them, Dinky Romley, Ricky Green, Judge Ricky Green, and Joan Countryman, who is going to get an honorary degree this year from Sarah Lawrence, and I became active participants in the civil rights movement. And it, a point in our last semester here, we organized a conference, the first conference of civil rights in the North. And we had a number of the people from the major civil rights organizations, as well as more than 300 college students from the Eastern Seaboard. We had uh, students from Princeton and Harvard and MIT and Yale and Brown. And they all came to these plenary sessions and workshops. And I remember thinking at the time uh, how marvelous it was that we had managed to get all of those young men to come to the, spend a weekend, to serious consideration of the most important issues of the day. And how wonderful it was that they were, their commitment was so strong that they had traveled some distance to participate. And it wasn't until some years later 
that I had a conversation with someone who happened to be there, who's now a middle-aged uh, graduate of Dartmouth, and uh, that I've actually learned the truth. And as he put it, he said, imagine a weekend on campus at Sarah Lawrence with all those girls. <laughs> we couldn't believe our luck. We loved it. I'm sure that the people at this conference are here for the right reasons. <laughs> so the title of this panel is Challenges and Opportunities for Progressive Public Education. To be honest, in the present climate, there is a good deal to say about challenges, precious little about opportunities. In fact, I think any responsible reaction to the challenge part might necessitate a hefty supply of antidepressants. Just to make sure that we're on the same page, I'm assuming that by progressive education, we mean ideas like advocating for democratic and diverse communities of teachers, students, families, that support by learning by doing, that emphasize problem solving and critical thinking, and that create school cultures of inquiry-based teaching and learning with curriculum that goes deep rather than wide, underpinned by discussion and assessment with approaches that put student work at the center and include emotional, social, as well as academic growth over time. If so, if this is a shared definition, then there seems to be little doubt. These are, these are mighty, perilous times for progressive education in general, but most especially for progressive education in public schools. I want to start with three central reasons for this. The obsession with testing, the co-opting of the language and discourse about educational practice, and the move towards privatization. These are in no particular order, but if pressed, I think I would have to start with the fact that we live in a period characterized by an obsession with testing, standardized testing, which has transformed conventional schools into test prep factories, dramatically reduced school time devoted to art, music, drama, and playtime, and forced even the most progressive public schools to pay much closer attention to how to prepare kids so their scores don't cause serious data-related problems for the school. The stakes, as they are described, are high, not only for kids whose promotion or entry to middle schools and high schools may depend on a few questions answered correctly or not, but also schools whose report card grade is 85% dependent on overall scores, and soon teachers whose tenure and rating will depend significantly on their students' performance. Now, I'm talking about New York in particular, but it really could be generalized across the country. Estimates are that testing and the preps involved with it takes away approximately 25% of children's academic school year. Aside from time, there are other consequences of all the testing that are antithetical to progressive education. What is not measured doesn't matter. And repeated testing and the power we attach to it teaches children that there is only one right answer for a question. Always the emphasis is on results, which coming from Washington, where the Obama administration can demand increased testing and other anti-progressive practices because it maintains the leverage in times of economic shortfall, increased testing has resulted from race to the top and the NCLB waiver, perhaps not so generously uh, offered by the USDOE. Without question, the emphasis on accountability as expressed through increased testing has increased an atmosphere in which corruption is ever present. Just for the record, if any of you should think that Atlanta's mis misdeeds represent the worst example of the country's obsession with testing, think again. The cheating scandals associated with high stakes testing in Ohio, Florida, Philadelphia, and Washington DC to mention just a few of the places charged are widespread and deep. In truth, it is New York, not Atlanta, that should claim the crown for the most students affected by test malfeasance. In our state, we don't rely on individual teachers to engage in erasure parties. Instead, we allow the state education officials to engage in what Daniel Koritz, the Harvard professor who was brought in to investigate New York State and report after the repeated charges of test fraud, he calls test score inflation. While the strategies differ depending on whether we're talking about three to eight testing or the high school regents, there has been manipulation of the most blatant sort. Keep in mind that from day one, Mayor Bloomberg made test scores the measure by which he would measure success or failure of his administration. Each year, he showed us that the scores went up. 
and Chancellor Klein loudly trumpeted along with the mayor the success story. Well, we now know that this was a fraud. Many of us knew at the time, since the, N N A N the NAEP, the NAP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is a sampling test conducted by the federal government and considered the gold standard in testing, never showed such an increase. In fact, scores for New York, the city, over the same period either remained flat or went down. Once the source of the test inflation was examined, the, fu the full extent of the discrepancy was revealed. Overnight, schools in New York City went from being called 81% proficient to becoming 18% on track. And in the high schools, the claims of success were even more suspicious. On the high school regents tests, raw scores, that is the number of answers correct, are always converted to a scaled score. And it's the scaled score that gets reported out. Conversion tables used on the 2010 math test, for example, converted to a raw score of 33 questions answered correctly out of 85 to a 65. 65, as most people understand that score, is 65 out of 100, a percent. This 65 meant something quite different. And just so you know, cutoff scores are not determined and announced uh, before the test. That is, you must get X number of questions correct to earn a 65. No, the conversion scores are assigned after the, all the tests have been collected, graded, and the cutoff score determined based on how students did and how many the state wants to have pass. Of course, these days, we're supposed to believe that the new tests which are supposed to assess the new national approach to standards and curriculum, known as the Common Core, will be completely different, and of course, better. Most states have signed on to one of two testing models, known as PARC and Smarter Balanced. And will these new Common Core tests make a difference? Will they push education in the direction of more thoughtful teaching and engaged learning? Our Harvard psychometrician, Daniel Koritz, has some serious doubts on a checklist that he made that lists impediments to what he thinks of as meaningful assessment, here's how he scores his responses to the question, what will the Common Core do to address the underlying problems? On the always present pressure to raise tests as the main measure of equality, he says, nothing. On the insufficient focus on the other, on the other important outcomes and aspects of quality, Koritz believes it will have no effect. On the insufficient focus on other important outcomes and aspects of quality, nothing. On the lack of monitoring for bad test prep and score inflation, nothing. On the lack of countervailing incentives, nothing. Koritz remains agnostic as to whether the Common Core will fix inadequacies of test design. Not a hopeful picture. Now onto the second challenge to progressive education the co-opting of the language of educational reform. It turns out that a se semantic infiltration, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan once called it, is a problem not confined to issues in education. Hendrik Hertzberg spends a whole column in the April 8th issue of The New Yorker, showing us how this practice fundamentally impacts federal policy, like labeling Social Security and Medicare entitlements. It's nearly impossible to have a, co a conversation about critical issues in education these days, because the terms no longer mean what we thought they meant. A good school is not a place where a child might spend hours engaged in active learning with teachers who had created a professional community. A good school is now nearly almost entirely associated with test scores. Progress reports, those report cards made public by the New York City Department of Education are not narratives based on what kids actually know and can do over time, but rather are public scorecards based 85% on test scores. Principals are no longer instructional leaders, but rather CEOs or data managers. College preparatory means high SAT scores. Formative assessments used before to describe what every teacher did as part of the curriculum and are now, are now commercial tests with commercial prep books and commercial teacher professional development. Public schools, uh, I'm sorry, um, performance assessments are now commercial products, not the actual work that kids produce. Public schools now include charter schools, which play by different rules. 
Charter co-location is definitely not an exercise in cooperation. And the list goes on. There's credit recovery, scaling up, and then there's the word reform. The pinnacle of semantic infiltration. This has been hijacked by the Joel Kleins, Michelle Rees, and as Diane Ravitch calls them, the Billionaires Club, Gates, Broad, and the Walton Foundation. There is no doubt language is critical, and we need to make it work for us. As Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg reported, I was doing all these sex discrimination cases, and my secretary said, I look at these pages, and all I see is sex, sex, sex. The judges are men. And when they read that, they're not going to, when they read that, they're not going to be thinking about what you want them to think about. So, as Ginsburg, Ginsburg said, I changed my claim to gender discrimination. We need new language that people understand, not high stakes testing. We need language to replace that. So I challenge all of you, wordsmithies, to write down on a piece of paper a, placement, a replacement term that will lead to greater public understanding. Please take that seriously. This brings us to the third challenge to progressive education, the privatizing of K-12 schooling. Now, while it's true that there is a considerable amount of privatizing of public education through charter management companies controlled by hedge funders, and certainly vouchers will fast forward this, what is often overlooked is the control asserted by private corporations through contracts, often the no-bid variety, given to the private sector in almost, every, in almost every aspect of educational activity. Test development, test prep materials, data collection, professional development, and curriculum development, textbooks, and the biggest ticket item of them all, technology. All are controlled by private corporations. Even school maintenance, and in some cases, the food service in public schools has been taken out of public control. Pearson has now cornered the market on tests test prep materials and curriculum. And disgraced media tycoon Robert Murdoch has restructured his problematic news corporation to create, amplify, his new education division, headed up by none other than the former New York City Chancellor, Joe Klein. Amplify, amplify has swallowed up Wireless Generation, a data collecting company which received multi-million dollar node bid contracts from the New York City Department of Education when Klein was chancellor, and has now gone national, trading and selling the personal data records of millions of children to companies that have somehow fallen us outside the regulation net normally governing confidential information. And we see the efforts of the National Rifle Association to put armed teachers into schools who would obviously operate under practices developed or at least influenced by the NRA. The list of challenges is actually longer than the three obstacles I've just discussed. And while not spending as much time on others, I think it's important to at least put a red flag in front of them. The first I will call the attenuation of commitment to equity. Forty years ago, my mother was solicited by one of her grandchildren for a contribution to her school. Grandma, she said, can you buy these raffle tickets? We're raising money for an arts program in my school. Despite the sales girl's charm, my mother resisted, commenti commenting to me on the side, I don't believe in paying this way for public education. She wasn't being mean-spirited. She knew what equity was, and that while my daughter's school was already pretty well sourced, other schools in the neighborhood were not. This is now a dilemma, big time, as parents in well-heeled neighborhoods like Park Slope, or Manhattan uppers, up, Manhattan's Upper West Side, raise hundreds of thousands of dollars while schools in Bed-Stuy and the South Bronx remain impoverished. We see the same dynamic in effect around more political issues, such as testing. When middle-class parents say, how's my child doing? They most often mean it in a competitive sense, as in, how did my child do in comparison with your child? After all, they regard school admission to middle school and high school as a, com as a competitive exercise. So my child needs to do better than your child. Working class parents usually mean something quite different. They mean, will their child make it to middle school, get into a high school? No mean feat in a city with an admissions process that involves 13-year-olds priority ranking their top 12 choices of schools. 
And annually, some seven or 8,000 kids get no first round choices in the city. We can see how that's playing out right now. This year, the new Common Core tests are being given. They will teach kids on a test kids on a curriculum which has never been taught and which few teachers have ever seen. It's so bizarre that what Chancellor Walcott has issued a warning in a letter backpacked to all third to eighth grade parents. He urged parents to talk to their children to tell them how difficult, how very, very difficult for L kids this test would be and how parents should tell their kids that they should do their best and then add the caveat. Despite that, they should tell their kids they could be anything they really want to be. This nonsense has resulted in some parents calling for a boycott of the, of the tests. Yet despite the present, the gen, but despite the general acknowledgement that the tests are unfair, that children are being used as guinea pigs, that test prep is destroying the curriculum with lots of worksheets flying home to prepare kids, also during vacation, parents at some of the most progressive schools in the city have expressed reluctance to take a stand because as one parent put it, we don't want to jeopardize what we have here. So even parents who are opposed to the test obsession, who put their kids into a school where the leadership resists the pressure, don't see this as an issue to fight for as a matter of principle on behalf of others. A sort of, I have what I want for my child, I need to protect it even if it's at the expense of other children not as fortunate as mine. And yet another obstacle. The national anti-union mood and the trashing of the teaching profession. Despite all the studies which show that parents overwhelmingly support their own child's teacher, attacks on the profession by politicians and the media get traction. It is debatable how much of this can be, can be tied to gender bias. That is, since 80% of the K-12 teaching force are women, the attacks could be interpreted as gender-related. Ask yourself, would the attacks be so vicious and continuous if the objects of the criticism were men? I have my doubts. But regardless, such attacks are noticed, and the union gets the brunt. Unions are, we are told, the cause of all the problems. Without them, things would improve. Really? Has anyone looked at the education in the non-union states? According to the Business Insider, these are some of the lowest performing states. South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, Virginia, all are non-union states. Would non-union proponents seriously consider swapping places with the children in these schools? Or joining the classes of more than 70 students found in Florida, where computers have replaced teachers for instructional classes? Back in the late 60s, some of us lamented when New York City gave up on local control of schools in favor of decentralization. We didn't know how good we had it. Debbie and I were talking about that last night. In the ensuing 45 years or so, the march to return to centralized administration has become unrelenting. Around the same time, Jay Featherstone wrote some, so about the marvelous child-centered public schools in the UK. The schools that were run by people called head teachers, individuals who came from the classroom and led their schools in purposeful child-centered fashion. Today, we have more central control than ever before, administered by young policy wonks who have never taught creating compliance regulations that tie the hands of those in schools who need flexibility to allow them to use common sense in order to serve children well. Today, no principal candidate is asked to explain how he would get across an idea to kids or how she would help a teacher think through an inquiry-based project or solve a problem between two families. Today, the priority in selecting principals is strictly data collection, data interpretation, and data implementation. So as you can see, I'm worried. Perhaps as Jay mentioned yesterday, there's something cyclical about, all the, uh, cyclical about all this, and we're in the midst of the proverbial swing of the pendulum, and we just have to wait. You know, the past progressive eras that seem to occur every 25 or 35 years, 1900, 1930s, 1960s, 1990s, the optimistic part of me hopes so. But I remain skeptical. I am worried about where we are heading. We seem to have fallen into a familiar pattern now, where we have public education increasingly controlled by folks who are quite comfortable making policy for other people's children, while their own attend the most progressive private schools money can buy. 
I have a simple request to those in charge. Just allow every kid to have access to the Sasha and Maria curriculum. I'm very glad to be here. I, um, should I put it up? Thank you. Um, my native language is Spanish, so you'll see I speak with an accent. Um, I have grounded my talk on the ideas of the script review um, from a bilingual, bicultural perspective, which has been my lifelong journey, passion, and also an area of struggle. Um, my introduction to the script review processes took place on a Saturday morning in 1991. I was in my second year of teaching in a bilingual classroom in Phoenix, Arizona. At the time, we had a local organization called Center for Establishing Dialogue in Education. Carol Christine, a prospect member and a faculty at Arizona State University, led the center. It was composed of progressive educators from all walks of life in a state where there are hardly many progressive people. People often came together to think about education for all children. Carol had invited Patricia Carini to work with several progressive schools in Phoenix, Arizona. Pat said she would come only if she worked with us over time. Jenny's story, the book, um, a book um, about a child um, that we followed for several years came out from this work. On this Saturday morning in 1991, two decades and a couple more years ago, teachers from several schools gathered to hear Pat Carini's talk and to participate in the first descriptive review presentations in the Valley of the Sun, Phoenix. A bilingual colleague of mine who had attended the first seminar titled Another Way of Looking was presentive, presenting a descriptive review of a bilingual child from her classroom. As soon as her presentation began, I was completely captivated by the rich description of the child, as well as by the questions and recommendations participants made after the bilingual teacher's presentation. Throughout the entire presentation, there was a complete sense of caring towards the child and who he was, as well as we thought about how to create a space that would nurture and challenge the child's interest and most of thinking and learning. We talked about the ways in which the child used his bilingualism to make sense of his world. She, the teacher described the child's writing of stories as coming from each ex rich experiences in two countries, Mexico and the US. As a group, we strive to understand what mattered to this bilingual, bicultural child, knowing that we could never truly figure out all about the child, but what, that we were striving to capture a snapshot from particular angles and at a moment in time. As I thought about this child throughout the day and the following weeks, other bilingual bicultural children I work with came to mind. For example, I began to think about children who had a love for language and couldn't wait to try their second language, as well as children who resisted learning English and kept using Spanish no matter what. I thought about children who loved to play with words in their native language, memorize jokes, nursery rhymes, riddles, trabalenguas, tongue twisters, chance, as well as children who appear to be shy and hard to know in either language. Alongside other colleagues, we began to pay close attention to children's artwork. We became interested in learning about what and who might have influenced this artwork. We became interested in the artwork of different regions from Mexico, as well as particular Mexican artists, Frida Kahlo, Orozco, Siqueiros, what fascinated me the most about this first experience with the descriptive review of the child was that we could spend this intense time thinking about a particular child, and only later, after being deeply grounded in the particular, we could begin to think about the larger educational implications for the children we work with. Most of them immigrant, bilingual, bicultural children. The conversations we had on this first day carried out to on to our staff meetings, school retreats, and hallway interactions. Many of the changes we made at the school emanated from these conversations. Multi-age classes, we changed from one year to multi-age classes. The need to have ample blocks of time, 
the need to offer the children open-ended materials, the role of the school library, the development of a late exit bilingual program, and later on a dual language program. As I reflect back now many years later, I think about my current work with bilingual teachers now. I am uncertain as to how much I truly understood right away about the implications of Karini's talk on that day and my context as a bilingual bicultural teacher. But the words building from children's strengths have echoed on my mind ever since. I have continued to wonder with like-minded colleagues and the prospective teachers I work with, what does it really mean to build on the strengths of immigrant bilingual bicultural children? What kinds of classrooms and environments would truly support the strengths of immigrant children and those strengths that they bring with them? These have not been easy questions to find responses to in the many places I have worked. By the year 2001, bilingual education was eliminated by voters in Arizona, democracy, making it against the law for a teacher to teach in a language other than English. According to the current law, in Arizona, a bilingual child has to first learn English in order to qualify for a dual language program. In other words, the, first child, the child first needs to negate his or her native language before being allowed to capitalize on one of his most effective basic funds of knowledge that they bring to school. Later on, when I moved in 2004 to New York City, the city of immigrants and multitude of languages and cultures, I find that bilingual schools, in particular in the area where I work, the Bronx, are in constant state of fragility. From year to year, language policies change at most schools where we place our bilingual student teachers. Principals discourage teachers to teach in the native language in order to push for a quick acquisition of English. They do it because they're under such tremendous pressures to produce test results in English. According to the state mandates, children have one year before they begin to test it, take this test in English. The demands to teach in English take place in spite of all the research that states that in the long run, bilingualism and biliteracy produce stronger results and better problem solvers. Not only is the native language not consistently invited into the curriculum as a learning tool, but the child's culture is often rendered invisible. Without doubt, Karini has helped us raise important questions as we imagine and reimagine schools for all children. For instance, during the years we work with her, we ask, what does it mean to create classrooms that are inclusive of diversity in the broadest sense of the word? What does it mean to have multiple entry points in the curriculum so that children see themselves reflected in it? Karini challenges us to imagine the kinds of space that will help children see themselves as human beings fully capable of contributing to new knowledge and ideas. These are questions I continue to ask myself now as I work with prospective bilingual teachers. We ask, what needs to be in place at a school and in the classrooms for bilingual bicultural children to stand firm on their cultural backgrounds, the values, their communities and families, their native languages. What needs to be in place so that we can truly build on their strengths? What does it mean to educate from a culturally relevant pedagogy? What is a culturally democratic, cl culturally democratic classroom for bilingual children look like? To find some answers, I began to work to think about the work of three researchers, Theresa McCarthy, Antonia Dardere, and Sharon Croning. McCarthy argues, in classrooms, curriculum and pedagogy are the mirrors with which students see themselves reflected and through which they construct images of themselves as thinkers, learners, and users of language. Educators have the ability to strategically manipulate those mirrors in ways that ensure that the image students see and develop is one of self-affirmation, efficacy, and trust. Without doubt, to be able to really see bilingual children, bicultural, bilingual bicultural children, what and how they experience curriculum matters. Children need access not only to their language, but also they need access to teachers who understand about their people's history, music, dance, oral traditions, art, current events, ways of doing things, ways of talking with others, ways of sharing stories. Researcher Antonia Dardere adds, there is intellectual, emotional, physical, spir and spiritual power in our ability to understand ourselves as fully, as full human beings. To be able to create classrooms where children see themselves, she adds, 
we need to be mindful that how teachers perceive the notion of cultural identity is especially important. Everyone has a culture. For some of us, this might appear more vis invisible because we're surrounded by it. And we take it for granted since everything we experience in daily life is done our way. For others to be able to see their own culture, they might need to unlearn and unpack their own internalized oppression, as stated by Croning. Several of the classes I teach at Lehman College, in particular the bilingual classes, are, compon of, as, are composed of immigrants from many parts of Latin America, but mostly from the Dominican Republic. Often my students write in their recollections about the ways in which others made them feel because they spoke with an accent or couldn't speak English at all. They write about being placed eternally in a lower group because they were at the time emergent bilinguals. Consequently, the curriculum they received was limited to large amounts of drills. They describe the painful ways in which they learned not to bring who they were into the classroom and how hard they worked to appear invisible. Once they begin the descriptive reviews of children, they often encounter children who refuse to speak their native language because early on they have figured out that English is the language of power. They describe classrooms that have an abundance of books, but lack books where the children can really see themselves represented. Of course, we also hear stories of teachers who recognize in an adolescent's artwork the colors of the artists from the student's homeland and culture. This student, Alidia, describes her absolute sense of awakening when she heard the teacher's words. The colors you use in your artwork remind me of the colors of the artists from Oaxaca. You use deep colors like them. Let me show you some pictures I have. In her recollection, Alidia described to us what an impact this interaction had in her ways of approaching art with her young son once she became a mom. She had surrounded him with images from artists from her homeland, Oaxaca. Elidia shared with us that she didn't want for her son to experience what she experienced. She had to wait until high school for someone to recognize where her artwork came from. For someone to move the mirror, as McCarthy argues. In class, as we hear each other's stories, we examine critically how our own agency within the circumstances can affect and impact and have an impact on a, more, on a type of teaching that is more culturally relevant. As I reflect upon these research words and the Lehman students' experiences, I ask myself, what does it mean to create classrooms and schools that are culturally relevant? I am reminded that the classroom, this res classrooms these researchers and stories tell and that they are helping us imagine are classrooms where bilingual, bicultural children need to have opportunities to awaken their voice. These are classrooms where students can bring their lives into the classroom as they affirm and receive affirmation for their individual and cultural strengths. As they begin to examine the cultural values and social identities of their lived experiences. That there adds that the isolation, alienation, and despair by cultural students' experience can be challenged when they have opportunities to explore critically how their experiences illuminate their participation in the larger society. As I engage in this dialogue with my bilingual prospective teachers, I echo that their words, bicultural educators who have found their voice can provide an effective bicultural mirror. These are educators who thought deeply about the ways in which school supports the values of particular groups while failing to provide spaces for other ways of knowing or other people's histories. My hope is that they will be educators committed to changing these invisible practices that silence some voices while maintaining the never-ending and overwhelming visibility of other voices. Karini asks us to think about developing a broad vision of schools that is inclusive of all children. It is clear that she was asking us to think about creating classrooms and schools that would be responsive to the community it serves. I ask now years later, what kind of experiences will offer the bilingual, bicultural children possibilities to imagine, to wonder, to care deeply about something while they bring to school who they are and who their families are. I ask about the, what conversations we can have in classrooms that will help the children make connections between past and present as they live daily in two cultures, two languages, or even more. I ask what experiences I need to provide if we're truly to shift the mirrors and how children see themselves reflected in the curriculum. 
in the daily life of the classroom, in the culture of the school. More recently, a new question has emerged for me. What does it mean to prepare teachers to work in communities rather than schools? What would a teacher need to know if she was prepared to be part of a community, or he? Karini passionately challenges us to envision sco schools, classrooms, and curriculum that embrace a larger and more inclusive vision of human capacity. Schools where teacher and children can be poets of their own lives. It seems to me that by offering the children and teachers more culturally relevant democratic spaces, certainly would open more windows of possibilities. Thank you. all been said, so I'm going to talk about something different. <laughs> but, um, and I'm also trying a new little device here. No, but that doesn't work. Something's wrong. Uh, this was supposed to keep me on time. See, what I do wrong? No, you didn't. It's, it's going down. It's not. It'll go off. Oh, I said, I get it. Oh, it says 9.30. Anyway, okay. <laughs> It's going gonna, it's gonna to make some noise when it gets to zero, and then I have to ignore it because I'll no doubt not be through. So uh, <clears throat> first, I, I wanted to tell you this story because it's been, uh, that it has nothing to do with what I'm going to say afterwards, although it has everything to do with it. Uh, someone told me that um, they have twins, and their twins uh, are finishing kindergarten. The twin part is actually not relevant, irrelevant. Uh, and this little boy, she went to uh, her son's school because she heard he was having trouble. And she went into the classroom to watch a math lesson, which was developed by Pearson. Now, she may have been wrong in everything I'm about to say. I didn't see this. But this is what she said the lesson consists of. First, the children, five-year-olds, watch a movie about some children learning to do some math with Legos. Then the screen is blank, and the children are then given a piece of paper with uh, various Legos on them. And not, no Legos, I don't know what you mean. A, a diagram. And they're supposed to do a math thing having to do with Legos, but there are no Legos. <laughs> so they're supposed to translate that film of children using Legos to this piece of paper. Uh, I don't think it would work a lot better with 15-year-olds, but it certainly is an odd way to teach five-year-olds. And uh, in any case, I just, I, I, it's, it, it's gotten beyond belief to me what I see in preschools and kindergarten. And I, I mentioned that because I started off as an early childhood teacher. <coughs> and uh, it was clear to me that how, how school was introduced to four and five-year-olds had a lot to how children thought of themselves as a member of this society. This was their first exposure to the public world. And uh, it reinforced the fears their families had for them and the fears uh, we all feel when we walk home into a public world. And uh, that democracy rests upon something very different. So I want to talk about democracy. And I know it's kind of irrelevant, uh, but I want us to remember that we, we may not long uh, even be able to talk about it. I think the idea itself of democracy is at risk today. And uh, not just in our country, <clears throat> but all around the world. And uh, I, I uh, haven't developed this enough to argue with people about it to, to understand what its roots may be. But one of the conceptions of democracy, which I want to end with, is that democracy is a arrangement that depends upon there being sufficient material resources so that uh, everyone can be uh, guaranteed 
a decent way of life, or as uh, I forget who the philosopher is who says, that you can imagine changing places with anybody in society, and while you pr may prefer not to, it's not the end of the world. And the other thing democracy depends upon is that uh, it has a time to think about governance. When uh, the schools that I've run claim to be democratic communities, uh, the, it requires of us, and some people uh, make such schools un, uh, unattractive, that we spend as a faculty and parents time thinking about governance. We need leisure to think together. And if you, uh, you're not as old as I am, when I was young, the word leisure class was a definition of a ruling class. It was a, another way of saying who ruled the world, the leisure class. And in ancient Greece, in fact, you couldn't vote if you worked because government required the full-time exercise of free human beings who were dependent upon no one else for their basic livelihood. And, you know, our country was founded upon principles not so very different. It wasn't founded upon the idea that all citizens really are capable of ruling. And it wasn't, in fact, even called a democracy. Uh, we have grown up for the last 200 years with, in our own education, with very inflated and rosy pictures of what democracy means. Uh, when we're children, we're told it means a majority rules, although there's virtually no place in the world in which that's what democracy means, including our own country. I was going to look it up to see if I came from uh, South Dakota, uh, I will, how much more um, voice I would have in the U.S. Congress. Someone might work it out statistically. I, I, you know, I, I might be a thousand people. Uh, I would be equal to a thousand South Dakotans in power. But since I come from New York State, uh, I'm hardly worth one. <laughs> uh, so it's, we have never lived in a society which fulfills the rhetoric of democracy. But uh, I grew up thinking we were moving towards it and that each generation saw uh, that was the rhetoric of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, 60s. Um, so part of what may be a dilemma right now is that um, even the ruling class doesn't want us to believe that anymore because uh, this is the first generation whose children are likely to make less money than their parents. And uh, this may be the last generation that assumes that their children will live in a better world. And that uh, has maybe an enormous cost on democracy. I was thinking about, uh, we were in Detroit about six weeks ago, and shortly after we left Detroit, Detroit as a political unit ceased to be. That is, it no longer elected the people who rule it. Uh, now, you know, that's to me something inconceivable. The governor of Michigan has the right to declare any state, any city, uh, his, to disempower the mayors and city councils of any state in Michigan which he believes are in, uh, at risk. How could that happen without an uproar? Why, wasn't, why weren't we marching in the street to save Detroit? Uh, decisions, because partly we've been focusing on education. And I just want to remind you, the things that we're scared about, about education, are happening all around us, in every field. And that's why it is so hard for us to get mobilize the energy, because people are feeling this sense of disempowerment in a whole variety of other endeavors. Uh, so that we're not in a unique position uh, and when we think about it, there is in our own tradition much that uh, disables us. And 
So I now want to look about how solidly the progressive tradition itself has uh, honored the idea of democracy. Now, I, uh, first I'll tell you a little story that, about a school I love. I went to ethical culture in Fieldston. Uh, but uh, every year, of course, I'm sure they no longer do this. Every year, we would have a celebration in the lower school of the founding fathers of ethical culture. And some of you have heard me tell this before, but they, they would tell us about how our beloved founders wanted a school for working men's children uh, to help change the world to a cooperative society, but that to do so, the uh, upcoming ruling class needed to be, my God, Chuck, quiet, quiet. I don't care what you say, you're wrong. Uh, because they, the new, uh, they needed to know, be well educated. So they were preparing the children of the future to uh, make America a full democracy. And we all, it was a stirring story. Do they tell, still tell it? Now, there was, I hope, many children who looked around and thought, I wonder where those working men's children are right now. <laughs> Any case, uh, just let it be a reminder. Uh, and in many ways, a great deal of progressive tradition rested on a kind of elitism which still exists in many of the places that we admire and love for their pedagogy. Um, I, I dropped by Fieldston about three years ago, and just to be unpleasant, and I went to a session of teachers on democracy, and I said, I, I know you need to charge high tuition uh, because you're a private school, but uh, what is the rationale for not accepting rich, dumb children? They're going to have a vote, too. They're important to our society. And besides which, as we progressives know, all children are gifted. And you know, even that, that, the way we say that. One hand, we say, well, he's very smart. And then the next moment, we say, but of course, all children are very smart. Now, if we thought all children were very smart, we wouldn't point it out about a particular child. I don't say, oh, you have two legs. Because <laughs> I take it for granted. <laughs> but uh, a great many of the people involved in the early testing movement thought of themselves as progressives. Progressive uh, had many different meanings. And what makes me honor Dewey is that I think he's closer to the meaning that I'm describing, and that is it rests on the idea, the utopian, absurd, ridiculous idea that everyone is were equally important, has an equal voice and an equal vote. And even though, uh, I, you know, I see some young people here who it seems to me don't know enough to have an equal vote with me. How come they have one vote and I have one vote? Shouldn't I have 10? Because I've lived 10 times as long as they have. It's, a, it, it's not a logical idea. It's, if you want, a religious idea we have about democracy. It's an act of faith. Uh, that's so that, but it counts on other things, such as equality of power. And in a society of enormous inequality of power, we have never, this country has never had as much inequality as it has now. It was close in the late 20s, but actually not as great as we have now. And it was not the, the uh, leaving aside slavery. How can you leave that aside? Uh, but uh, there was more equality in America at the time of the revolution than there is now. We have lost sight of the fact that democracy rests upon a relatively, a relative uh, equality where money doesn't 
trump all. My brother and I argued in our childhood, would we rather be famous or rich? You know, we'd have different times and we would argue it out. And I won't tell you who was on which side. But there's no difference today, right? You cannot be rich and not be famous. And you cannot be famous and not be rich. We, the, the country is built. Read these uh, terrible stories about what's happening with college sports. Now, I don't think they've ever been uh, probably totally clean. But uh, that our institutions, our academic higher education institutions uh, are built on exploiting largely black young men. I mean, drown right exploiting them, not giving them a dollar for the fact that they give four years to bringing in enormous amount of money for their bosses on the hope they will be one of those few people who someday will make a living at it and probably not themselves get even a BA. How could it be possible to imagine higher education built on such a corrupt base? And uh, anyway, I just uh, the degree to which we have in a way sunk is hardly an optimistic way to end this talk. <laughs> uh, but it does seem to me that the, the tasks are one, to look at ourselves more carefully, to think about our own language, the assumptions of the institutions we live in. You know, here we have schools made up of mostly women with uh, good educations. I mean, in today's terms, at least, they all have at least BAs, and most of them have master's degrees. And the number of schools that are democratically run are how many in the country, you imagine? Uh, the adults who are in our schools are not treated as though this was a democracy. And on the whole, we would say that they want to either have the time or the knowledge to be part of the ruling class of that school. Uh, if they're not knowledgeable enough and wise enough and skilled enough to be part of the ruling class of their schools, then why, how could we dare claim that anybody, um, that any of us deserve a vote about the problems of society at large? You know, we think of democracy as a luxury. If we had the time, we'd run this institution democratically, but we're all too busy. So I want to come to my last argument. And uh, you'll see how there's a contradiction between these. I think we have become, do you remember in the 60s, we all thought we were going to have a 20 hour week? I mean, how many of you were active in the 60s? Not many. Uh, well, then I'll tell you about it. We all thought that uh, technical progress, technological progress, and egalitarian progress was going to lead to a world in which all oh, we didn't have to work so hard. And that we would have leisure. And uh, I think we've gone in the exact opposite direction. We have incredibly increased productivity and less leisure. We are driven crazy with busyness, which is part of the reason why as teachers we don't even want to be involved in the governance of the school, because it's hard enough to find time to be parents, much less govern our schools. We are kept extraordinarily busy. I look at my website, and Anne must get this, uh, about what every principal gets at the beginning of the month or the beginning of the week, a whole list of things they're supposed to do the following week. I mean, it's got, but there's, I look at it and think, does anyone actually do all these things? <clears throat> now, we had the advantage in the old days that there was no internet, so if they, if they sent out lists like that, they sent them by mail and it went in the wastebasket. <laughs> and I f apologize, I would say, I never got your letter.
But they now know that you did, right? We, we need both to fight for more leisure, and I mean it. We need to fight for the time to get together face to face. And uh, you know, as the women's movement did in the 70s, realize that our problems are collective problems, not just individual problems. Get the reassurance of realizing the, the changes that need to happen need to be changes that will change the lives of not just me, a better job, a better step up the ladder, but will influence in thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. So we need the leisure for that as well as to get the inspiration from reading wonderful novels and poetry and painting, to believe that that's, we want it for children, we say. They should have art in school. We have to remind ourselves that how few of us have the time for art ourselves. Uh, and then at the same time I'm saying that, I have to tell you that we also have to spend our leisure time going to meetings to change the world. <laughs> and uh, it's a contradiction there. And uh, maybe we should all, you know, choose numbers in a lottery. And mine says that I do that Mondays to Thursdays, yours says Fridays to Sunday, or, you know, some way in which we can distribute this so that we can both destroy, to restore. We can destroy what we have and restore what we need. And that is the time to be loving human beings as well as the time uh, to make sure that our neighbors are well taken care of too. Thank you very much. I think we might have time for two questions. <laughs> um, so do, do, do we have some out there? Speak up because we don't have much time. Um, hi. Okay, do you want to go or can Are I go first? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll make it quick. Um, so I come from, you know, low-income family, immigrants, um, impoverished, and I'm tired of being told I have to be a blade of grass coming through the cracks of the sidewalk. And I'm actually more interested in tearing up the sidewalk and flower bombing it. Um, so. I kind of feel like your talk has given me that sense that there are people who get it, that it has to be um, a complete radical revolution in how we are people and human beings. And I don't need to suffer, and my students and my children don't need to suffer and make it through. We have a right to thrive. And um, yeah. <laughs> So my question is, um, it sounds like there's a lot of work to be done on the policy level, which from my understanding as a young student in the world sucks. I mean, I don't want to spend my days necessarily in an office in Albany. I'd much rather be working with children every day. So how do we navigate this need for policy reform or that that's the way real change seems to happen? Um, that's the way these policies have gotten implemented. So we have, to, we have to go to that level, right? We have to become policymakers at some point, or, right? And I guess my question is, is that the way we start bringing change? Is that the avenue? Is it through these policy things? Are these meetings going to be that we're attending to change the world about policy on that level? Yeah, no, in a way, no. <laughs> and I want Anne to add to this, because uh, Anne has been, even more than I have been, active on the policy level. <laughs> but it isn't by becoming a policy person 
you know, I had a lot of friends who became policy people, a lot of friends who went to work for Joel Klein. And uh, uh, I'm not saying that the work they did there wasn't worth doing, but I would say that the, the institution had more influence on them than they had on uh, the institution. This means building something so that when, when and if you decide to go to Albany, you're speaking on behalf of people whose voice you are genuinely re uh, representing, not just pretending to represent, but genuinely representing. And uh, that's, uh, I'm not an expert on that. But uh, that's the, pick. I think we too often think like a ladder ourselves, that if we only could get up at the top, or we could elect somebody who's like us, um, they wouldn't have to deal with the fact that we haven't taken real power, which is in the area of ideas uh, and cu culture that supports our ideas. Um, even if, I don't mean that it has to be the whole country, but it has to be a substantial background. Uh, one, one of the best um, analyses, I think, of the uh, first Obama administration was done by Van Jones, who had been part of the administration. And one of the things that he said early on was that the mistake that was made by the people who, got, who were very hopeful was that they kind of pulled back and wanted to give Obama a chance, rather than seeing that their job was to keep the heat on and to keep a, have a voice that would push, because there's, there's, there's pushing from, from all directions. And so I think that, of course, we need people who can develop policy at some point. But the problem is most people who go into educational policy these days have never spent any time in classrooms. And so you get people right now coming in, uh, talent, what are they called, Laura? Talent coaches? Okay. Uh, who are coming around to the schools, to the principals, and taking the principals into classrooms to tell them how to use the observation tool developed by Danielson for the Common Core, or for the teacher evaluation. And you ask them, well, what's your background? And they've never been in a classroom. And they're telling principals how they're supposed to observe good teaching. So I think that we've got to get, we've, first of all, I don't think you can do anything on your own. I think that it's all about a group effort. It's schools, schools are all about communities and professional communities and problem solving and working together to figure out what, how you want to make your school work. And I think that, that it, it probably would be a very good idea to ha never have a policy person who only does policy, but to have them have one foot in the classroom at all times to keep them grounded. Thank you. I'm going to let that be the last word. I just want to add to Anne's. I, I also um, guess I'm pleading for you not to assume that the only place you need to have a voice now is in school reform. We will not win the school reform battle until we win us make substantial. We don't win any of these battles. Substantial progress on the democracy battle. And uh, we know it from the voting and so forth. Uh, that is, we have, uh, we have even uh, in the House of Representatives, which used to be more close to one vote for each person, we now have a gerrymandering phenomena. We now have the phenomena of uh, impediments to getting to the polls itself, and the millions of particularly people of color who have been deprived of the vote uh, through the legal system. I mean, we have, we, so fighting, if you can't, if the battle in your school is not one that's worth the energy, take that time to think about the larger democracy. And um, if you finally come to the point in which you say, I can't look myself in the mirror another day, quit and go into some other battle. This is a battle that's taking place all kinds of places. We just have to be in there and not give up. And then we have to, and while we're doing that, we have to read novels and listen to wonderful music. And, 